Okay, and we're live. Recording in progress. So today we have Richard Capriola, who is uh, now retired. What would you classify yourself as a addictions counselor is what it says on your website. Is that what you would classify yourself as? I know you also worked in the state legislature for yes. 30 years. Uh I, yes, I did. Before I moved into uh, mental health and addictions, I, you know, when I worked at Menninger Clinic, I worked with adolescents and adults who were diagnosed with both mental health and substance abuse disorder. Yeah. So I would say mental health and substance abuse disorder. Mental health and substance abuse. Yes. So despite not graduating with a high school diploma, you have a bachelor's degree and two master's degrees. Correct. And a long and illustrious career, career spanning uh, four decades. Yes. And you are now retired and you live in Texas with your wife. And you're going to talk with us today about preventing addiction in teenagers and youth yes, and how absolutely. to help them, how to help them if they are addicted. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having and me to uh, have that discussion with you. I'm so, so excited for you to be here. This is something that really concerns me. I have a great love for my, for my country, for children, and I really want to prevent as many sad stories as possible when it comes to the drug use. And especially with the overdosing that happens with people who may not know what's in those drugs. A lot of those mm -hmm. synthetic drugs that you talked about in your book, um, Richard Caprilla wrote The Addicted Child, which is a, a fabulous book. It's a really good, straightforward, um, practical approach to, for parents to learn about drug addiction, because I know a lot of things like that. Um, I mean, you actually name the drugs, you tell what their nicknames are, you tell how they're ingested. And th these are things that a lot of parents don't know. And you also have on your website, up to date, I guess, updates about the new developments with drugs and how they're yeah. used and how to, and you also talk about how to recognize, I, I have a ton of questions about your book, actually. <laughs> But before we dive into all that, um, could you just tell us your background, how you got started and like where you grew up and how you got started into all of this? I'm originally from Illinois uh, in the Midwest in the United States. Um, went to college in Illinois, uh, both at Western Illinois University and the University of Illinois. Worked in the field of education for the state of Illinois for um, a long time. And then as I transitioned out of that career, I moved into mental health and uh, substance abuse, starting out working in a mental health crisis center. So, and I so know how did you go from state legislature to mental health? What I, I, I basically retired uh, okay. from that career at a very young age uh, because I started working for the state as an intern right after college and then okay. worked at the State Board of Education for about 30 years. Uh, so I was fairly young when I was able to retire uh, from that line of work. And uh, I had started out working part time in a mental health crisis center. And then after okay. I retired from the state, I moved over and began working uh, pretty much uh, full time, almost full time for the crisis center until I was offered a position as an addictions counselor for Menninger Clinic in Houston, Texas. I uh, worked for them for about 11 years, uh, and that's where uh, I did most of my work in mental health and substance abuse for people who have what we call a dual diagnosis. They have a diagnosis of mental health and a diagnosis of substance abuse. So um, I was uh, I was basic, basically working as an addictions counselor there for at Menninger Clinic. So in your book, you talked about um, not just substance abuse. You also talked about, oh, I can't remember the phrase of it. Um, behavioral yes bad behavioral abuse yes. i can't remember what, what did you what was the phrase the actual phrase you called it these are um, things like self-harm and stuff like that yeah these are what we call process addictions process, uh, thank you. and i included them in my book and examples would be uh, uh, uh self-injury and eating disorders those are the two that are in the book uh i included them you had because gaming in there as well and I had gaming in there as well. And I put those in the book because sometimes for some some kids, not all, but for some kids, they will be uh, uh, 
using substances like alcohol or marijuana or drugs, and also developing an eating disorder or self-harming. So it's important that parents know the warning signs for a child that might be developing an eating, eating disorder or a child who might be self-harming to know what those warning signs are, as well as the warning signs for alcohol and marijuana and drugs. So you cover, when it's called the addicted child, it really is about all sorts of addictions not just the typical ones that we think of. It, it's it's the, the ones we typically think of, the alcohol and the drugs, but also the process addictions like yeah. eating disorders, self-injury, gaming, gambling, things like that. We don't see a lot of that in, in teenagers, although I think self-injury, particularly among boys, might be a little higher than what we think it is. Most, oh, really? of, the, most of the ones that I dealt with were teenage girls. So with the self-injury thing, would that perhaps as well um, exhibit in maybe just a lack of safety of what you would call being aware that you are able to be hurt, like just a just more disregard for safety among boys? It seems like to me that would be more of a, a risk for boys. Yeah, I I think whether it's a boy or a girl, if we look at the under underlying reasons why they might be um, cutting on themselves, it's not that much different than why they might be using a substance. And, and in yeah. both cases, it's to medicate some type of underlying psychological issue that unfortunately often gets diag misdiagnosed. The example I would give you is that um, uh, many of the teenagers that I worked with at Menninger Clinic who were smoking marijuana sometimes multiple times a day, when I asked them to help me understand why they were smoking so much marijuana, the number one answer that came back was it helps me with my anxiety. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, that's the case for many kids. Now, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's depression, maybe it's some type of trauma, maybe it's an emerging personality mm -hmm. disorder, maybe they've been bullied at school that parents didn't know about. But whatever it is, they are using a substance like marijuana or alcohol or some other drug to medicate that underlying issue that yep. unfortunately often does not get diagnosed and treated. We'll treat the alcohol, we'll treat the marijuana, we'll treat the drugs, but we don't treat the anxiety. And if we don't treat the anxiety, the child's likely to relapse and get back into the drugs because they want the relief. So the anxiety, I guess that's where I'm really wanting to dig into is this initial cause of the desire to have that relief and why, how parents can help them to have that in a healthy way instead of feeling that they need to self-isolate with some sort of substance. Yeah, I think the first thing parents need to do is to get a good psychological assessment so that they know what they're dealing with. Maybe it is anxiety, but maybe it's maybe it's something else. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's a, some type of uh, uh, personality disorder that's developing. The way to uncover that is to get a professional psychological assessment so that you can either rule in or rule out you, whether or not your child is developing or, or dealing with and coping with these underlying issues because if if he or she is you need to have that treated uh, either through medication or perhaps a combination between medication and therapy so what percentage of kids that you have dealt with did say i'm doing this because i have anxiety and i need to relax um a very high percentage of them that were smoking marijuana uh, but I worked okay. in a uh, but I worked in a psychiatric hospital, so a lot of the kids that were coming to the hospital, the situation had gotten really out of hand. The parents had really were forced into a situation where okay. they had to hospitalize their child, and in many cases, it was a result of not just the drugs but the underlying mental health issue that was combining with the drugs to force them into uh, a situation where they had to be hospitalized. So that mental health issue, is that, how is that um, preventatively dealt with? What do, what do you think? Well, I guess we'll get to that in a minute, kind of more, more toward the end. I want to talk a little bit more, more about your book first, just because there was a lot in there that I think would be great for parents to recognize. But I would like also to talk about later on how we can forge a connection or, or um, 
sort of a blockade so that it never comes to that. If yes. that makes sense. Comes yes. to the drug yeah. use. Um, I first wanted to talk about the chapter on alcohol. I was really interested when you talked about that the alcohol use, if permitted by parents when a person is a teenager or around there, that it you, leads to alcohol abuse, more likely leads to alcohol abuse when they're a bit older. I'd never heard that before. Yeah, that comes from a study where they looked at um, uh, environments where um, parents, for example, would permit their child to drink alcohol at home. Uh, right. It's almost like, well, you can drink it here at home, but I don't want you drinking it away from home. Yeah. <laughs> and, what, and what they found out was mm -hmm. in, in those type of environments where there's a permissive attitude about the child drinking alcohol at home, when those, child, when those children left home and went to college, they ended up drinking more alcohol than the children who came from homes where it was more restrictive and not allowed. And I thought it was interesting. I can't remember if it was the smoking or the drinking or if it was both that you said in the book that even if the parent has that behavior and yet they still disapprove of it, there's less likelihood of the child engaging that behavior when they're older. Yes, I think a lot of kids take their cues from parents and, and they may not admit it, but they, 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 they look up to their parents for guidance. So if you have an environment where it's very clearly made that it's not allowed, it's not, it's not you know, something to engage in, um, you know, children pay attention to that. You might not think they're listening. You might not think they're paying attention, but it, it, it's getting watching. through. <laughs> it's getting through. Yeah. And they're always just looking and seeing what you do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what should and, I do? Yeah. Sorry, what were you saying, Dan? Um, you know, how kids get involved in drugs Every, every kid's different. Some of them get involved because they're curious about it. They've heard about this thing called marijuana. They want to try it. Uh, and then depending on whether they have a good experience or a bad experience, they either continue mm. or they don't. Some get involved because of peer pressure. You know, the friends they hang around with sort of pressure them into going along. And then okay. as we were talking earlier, this there's this group of, of kids that are using a substance to medicate an underlying mental health issue. And they found out that it helps. Like the kids who were smoking marijuana, they found out that it helps with their anxiety. Well, once yeah. they find out something helps with the anxiety, they're more likely to stay with it. What they don't realize is that although it may initially help their anxiety, it has a rebound effect. It'll make the anxiety worse over time. So there are so many directions we could go with that. Um, I wanted to ask you about the the way you treated that. But first, I wanted to ask you about just going back to the alcohol for a little bit. Um, over here in the UK, there is the legal age limit for having a glass of wine at dinner with your parents is 16. And by age 18, people are just allowed to buy alcohol. Um, so I wondered what your thoughts were about that coming from the states where it's until 21 you're not allowed to drink alcohol at all right so um just the age difference in that and how it affects brains when people start that social drinking at age 16 well i think what's important for parents to understand is that regardless of whether their child is 15 or 16 or 18 their brain is not fully developed our brains don't become fully developed until around age 24 or 25. So when you start introducing a substance, whether it's a drug like marijuana or it's alcohol, uh, you run the risk of doing damage to that developing brain. And as parents, what we want to do is protect our child and protect our child's brain. Yeah. So I would be very careful, even in European countries, in terms of uh, of allowing that child to drink alcohol. I'm not saying they, they shouldn't do it, but you certainly you, you want to be very careful with you know, what they're drinking, how much they're drinking, and how often they're drinking. It may be perfectly legal in those countries, but the brain is the same over there as it is in the United States. It's, it's developing. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So along with that, um, and, and the brain developing and then 
trying to make sure that they don't abuse alcohol, which does easily come about with all that sort of thing. Um, what would you say would be a good guideline for, for the parents of where it's a socially acceptable thing to have a glass of wine at dinner at a young age? Would you say, don't even go there? Or would you say very much restricted? Just for, I, you know, I would sorry. say don't even, I would say don't even go there okay. uh, because once you introduce it, uh, you really have no control over whether that child's going to continue drinking outside of the home or not. So once you introduce it with an attitude of, oh, it's okay, uh, you run the risk of it getting out of hand. So just don't even open that door. I wouldn't even open that door. It's too risky. Too risky. Fair enough. I mean, <laughs> even if it's, um, there's a lot of things that we do socially that aren't the best and aren't okay <laughs> for our bodies. Well, and again, there's a difference between adolescents and adults. Many things which are okay or legal for adults are not necessarily healthy for adolescents because, again, of their brain. You know, here in the United States, for example, many of the states here have legalized marijuana for adults, not for yeah. kids. But, uh, and unfortunately, that often leads to the perception among kids well, if it's okay for adults, it can't be that bad for me. No, that's not necessarily true. Yeah, kind of like, um, I think phone use is another similar one. I tried to restrict my children's phone use. I'm like, your brain's not <laughs> going to soak this up a lot more than me being able to say, I have to check my messages. I'm going to put this down now, you know. And and that's that's a completely different topic in terms of social media and teens, but it's an yeah. important, it's an important topic. Yeah, I just know that it hits those dopamine pathways as well. Yeah, you know? Absolutely easily lead to addiction that's what a lot of social media is is actually um engineered to do <laughs> yeah. um i wanted to ask you as well about the inhalants yes i know cigarettes have gone down in use although i have heard they're surging again recently um but also the vaping has become very popular and a lot of people seem to view it as less harmful than cigarette smoke could you break that down for us Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because at least here in the United States, um, surging, uh, uh, vaping has been yeah. surging among adolescents. The percentages yeah. are just rising dramatically. Um, and that was before the pandemic. Oh. Um, you know, if, if, yeah. if we look at... Um, uh, nicotine vaping, marijuana vaping, uh, for three years prior to the pandemic, teenage vaping was going up at a dramatic rate. Um, wow. the, a large percentage of teenagers were turning to vaping. Now, cigarette smoking is at a very low level now. But what's happened is kids, teenagers, have switched from getting their nicotine by smoking cigarettes or cigars, and they've switched to getting their nicotine to vaping. The yeah. problem with that is when you smoke tobacco, you get all the other carcinogens that go along with it. When you are vaping, you're vaping nicotine purely. So you're getting higher concentrations of nicotine through vaping. Okay. But um, parents need to be aware that this vaping among teenagers is dramatically increasing. And what are the risks associated with vaping versus traditional cigarette smoking? Well, kids might tell you, for example, that vaping nicotine is safer than smoking cigarettes. Okay. And to a certain extent, they're right, because when you smoke cigarettes, you don't get just nicotine. You get hundreds of other carcinogens packed in with the tobacco. You don't get that with the, with the vaping. But what you do get is a higher concentration of nicotine, which means it's much more addictive. And whether it's, and whether it's uh, smoking cigarettes, cigars, or vaping nicotine, it's all going into your lungs. And there is the risk, uh, you know, in terms of damage that you could be doing over the long term. So um, what's what's added in with this um, nicotine into the vape? What are the other, I know there are other additives, flavorings, things like that. 
It, well, it's basically pure nicotine. Doesn't have okay. a lot of the carcinogens that come along with tobacco. But then there's also flavoring, as you mentioned, uh, that can be added, which is more appealing to kids too. And the other thing which makes it popular among teenagers is it's easy to conceal. You know, you can yeah. take a vape pen, you can put it in your pocket, you can go to school and you can head off to the to the bathroom and, you know, take a couple of hits while you're in there. Um, and many teachers, as well as parents, they don't know what a vape pen looks like. They've probably never seen one. So, so the, vape, the vape is going to smell like whatever flavor. So would it just smell like if it's flavored, flavor? if it's flavored, otherwise you're, you're going to get, you know, the smoke from the vapor okay. um but you know the thing be, there's a difference between vaping where you can take maybe two or three hits of it and you're done right. versus trying to smoke an entire cigarette which might take you a few minutes so yeah. it vaping it can be very quick which allows the teenager to get away with it fairly easily just slip in puff puff yeah go. yeah but the thing the message to parents is this vaping is becoming more and more of an issue among adolescents as we see the percentage of teenagers turning to vaping, um, you know, increasing significantly. Okay, so I really want to get into why it's bad to vape. Um, so you said there's more nicotine, which makes it more addictive. Yes. Why is what effect does the nicotine have on the body? Why is this so damaging? Well, it, it affects two major organs of the body. First of all, the brain. Like any other drug, nicotine eventually hits your brain. Uh, and when it hits your brain, it runs the risk of doing damage there. But it also affects your lungs, too, because you are taking the, the smoke, the vapor, and you're inhaling it into your lungs. Now, you know, it might not do immediate damage, but neither does cigarette smoking either. But if you were to continue to vape like you can uh, or were to continue smoking cigarettes, you run the risk of 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road of potentially having done some severe damage. So has vaping been around long enough for us to see those? Probably those not. Probably no. not. Um, okay. You know, but but the message to parents is be aware of this thing called vaping and be aware that it is extremely popular among teenagers and the percentage of kids who are turning to vaping is increasing uh, rapidly. And in your book, you said that vapes can be disguised as USB um, thumb drives. Um, you know, sometimes the vaping pen will hook up to a USB. There's different okay. ways of concealing it. I, I really think the majority of kids who are vaping are using what's called a vape pen. Looks like a okay. pen, uh, and it has a cartridge in it. And it looks a little... like an ink pen, or yeah, or it looks like a it looks like a regular pen, um, mm -hmm. except. You know, you can inhale smoke through it um, and uh, has an atomizer in it, which turns yeah. the nicotine into smoke and then you inhale it. So, you know, they're they're small enough so that you could carry them in a purse or you could carry them in your pocket. Well, I've seen um, vape pens, but the ones I've seen are usually a little bit bigger. So I'm, I didn't know that there were ones that were narrow enough to just look like a regular pen. It's like any market, you know, <laughs> you could probably get them in any size and shape and color yeah. that you want. Jeez. Well, thank you for letting us talk about the vaping. That's, that's a bit scary that it can be so subtle, you know? Yeah. And yeah, again, we'll get into how to, how to prevent them even wanting to do that. Um, I also wanted to ask you about narcotics and yeah. I wanted to ask you what the most popular ones are right now. Um, what the highest risk that parents would need to watch out for amongst narcotics and I guess should we include um over-the-counter narcotics that are prescribed in this or should we treat that separately well um I think parents need to be aware that if they have any prescription medications at home they need to secure them along with alcohol because kids are very clever they can get into the medicine cabinet and take just yeah. a few pills and you know either to use themselves or to sell so if you have any prescription medication over-the-counter medication any alcohol you need to secure it and make sure kids don't have easy access to it um, because you, you you run the risk of them having you know getting a hold of it um, yeah I remember that story you wrote about um, the boy who took the gin and vodka out of the <laughs> 
covered and filled the rest of the bottle with water so it didn't look like you'd taken any yeah you know that's a fairly routine clever little trick they'll go to you know they'll go to vodka because it's clear and they'll take what yeah. they want and they'll replace it with water and, and parents are less likely to catch on to it uh, i think his parents eventually did catch on to it but it took a while Oh, goodness. Uh, the other drugs, the more hardcore type of drugs, drugs like uh, cocaine, um, methamphetamine, uh, fentanyl, um, those among teenagers are being consumed at very low percentages of teenagers, probably okay. less, probably less than 3%. So the majority um, is marijuana. Then. Marijuana, alcohol and vaping. Okay. Uh, right. But but parents need to be aware that um, the danger with the drug, for example, like fentanyl, is not that your child is likely to go out and look for fentanyl. They're, you know, they may, but chances are they won't be looking for fentanyl. But it could come disguised in other drugs that they may get their hands on, it's drugs that they buy over the, over, over the street, on the street. Or online even or even online, they may yeah. be looking for a drug, um, but when they get it, it contains fentanyl that they didn't know about. And that's the danger with fentanyl. It's not that these kids are gonna run out and try to buy fentanyl. They, most of them wouldn't, but it may be laced in other drugs that, that they do have access to. It's a very well, it, deadly drug. It's just occurred to me that um, probably a lot of people won't have heard of fentanyl because it's I think fairly new in the public consciousness yeah could you maybe talk about what it is and why it's so dangerous well it's deadly first of all yeah um and here in this country the United States there seems to be an epidemic of fentanyl coming across the border uh and it, and it really is getting out of hand and unfortunately because it's such a powerful drug um it's it's killing a lot of people through overdose um, is it is it a synthetic or a natural drug um is it's it... not a it's not a i'm not sure if it's a th synthetic um okay. but it is um it's deadly yeah and i think a lot and really i think small. a lot of people are overdosing um not intentionally they're overdosing by taking too much of it um and and it's just it's just getting out of hand so someone could say buy a drug off of a friend or someone online and it's been laced with this fentanyl and they take it once and it could it could be fatal it could be it could be because again you don't know what's in it you know and and even drugs that you buy off the street maybe it's marijuana even that kids might buy off the street you don't know what's in it unless you unless you're buying this through a dispensary which is controlled a legal dispensary you don't know what's in a street drug it could be anything it's yeah. come down it's come down through the channel and changed hands so many times that you don't know what it's what it what it really contains you might think it's safe but you you really don't know what is in a street drug it just i guess all these things you're talking about the fact of children's brains not being developed enough to understand the risk of that and yeah. that um they feel this anxiety and they're just wanting to ease it just to take that risk just boggles my mind, but I, you know, to take the risk of putting in your mouth or in your body, something that you have no idea really where it came from. I mean, to us as adults, that seems crazy, yeah. but to the, but to the adolescent brain, which isn't fully developed and doesn't really have the capability to do abstract reasoning and think through mm -hmm. pros and cons, they're just going to impulsively react and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and, and, and if somebody gives them a, a drug, they may take it. They may try just to see what it's like. Well, I think that's where we as parents come in to be that guardian, to be like, let's let's block this. Let's not go yeah. past this. Let's yeah. Let's uh, to protect them, really. That's that's our job, is to protect our kids. Yes. Um, okay. I had a few more I have so many questions written down for you. Um, I want to let you talk freely, but I also have all these topics. That I That's great. That's great. Talk. Good. I wanted to ask you as well about the self-harming, moving in now to those process disorders you were discussing yeah. earlier, uh -huh. um, about how you stop, how you prevent kids from, from getting there in the first place. 
Well, I don't know that you can prevent them from getting there. Um, I, I think it's important to recognize that self-harm, you know, that's a tough concept for parents. Which, why, why would any kid cut themselves? I don't, yeah, make you, it. you talked about like a self-loathing. Yeah, well, the, the, it, it, might be hard, it might be hard for people to understand. But when a child cuts on themselves, for example, they're getting relief. Okay. We think it hurts. But if you talk to them, you find out that what they're doing is they're trying to get relief from some type of an emotional distress. And they have learned that the cutting uh, or the burning or whatever they're doing actually gives them relief from that intolerable thought, feeling, or memory. And once they experience sorry. that, once they experience that relief, then they latch on to it because it helps. Kids are no different okay. than adults. If we have an intolerable thought, feeling, or memory, we're not built to just set with that. We want to get rid of it. Same thing with kids. And unfortunately, in too many kids, they're finding that relief is in the form of alcohol, drugs, or cutting. Um, is it true that cutting stimulates an endorphin release? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, like a, like dopamine, for example. Yeah. Uh, and that's why they will report to you that it really doesn't hurt. It gives them relief. And that's a relief is what they're after. And as I so described it's, it's it. It's a sort it, of innate drug they're releasing. It is in a way. Yeah, I, I think it, if you get the same effect of dopamine in the brain that you would get from, from a drug, sort of like a high. Um, wow. and, and the thing is, kids are very clever at being able to hide their self-injury. So it's hard for parents to pick up on it because they'll do it in areas of the body that aren't visible. You know, they'll do mm -hmm. it on their stomach. They'll do it on their thighs. Uh, they'll do it in areas that a parent might not notice. So I have some tips in my book on things that you can look for. Yes. Yes. I actually wanted to talk about that. I wanted to, um, after we talk sort of about the different things to talk about, it was funny because as I was going through a lot of the, um, the things to look for overlapped, you know, there were yeah. a lot of very similar, similar behaviors, I guess. Yeah. Would be the word. Um, so I wanted to ask as well, though, with that, um, with the self-harm, is it, I, I was thinking it'd almost be better to, if they're looking for an endorphin release or um, that sort of thing. For me, the first thing that comes to mind is exercise, you know, going and doing something healthy. And if that's something parents could, or could, is part of treatment plans, if you guys do that as part of a treatment plan, like let's find a better way for your body to release these endorphins that you need. Well, it, you know, a, a good treatment program will address nutrition eating habits and exercise, all of which are important. Um, and if your child's not in a treatment plan, you as a parent can arrange for those two exercise programs, uh, get them involved in a gym, get them involved in, in yeah. some type of sports activity if they're willing, uh, good nutrition. Uh, but you still have to un still have to address the underlying psychological reason yeah. why that child is cutting. That has to be that has to be diagnosed and it has to be, you know, treated. And is that the same underlying causes that you would find with an addiction like gaming or eating disorders? Uh, it may be for eating disorders. Um, okay. You know, it may not be for gaming. That's an completely different issue. Uh, okay. But it but it might be for eating disorders again regardless of, of, of what your child is coping with. And, and, and these are coping skills, really. Yeah. They're unhealthy, potentially addictive coping skills. You need to find out what is your child trying to cope with? What's the underlying reason? Um, you know, in too many cases, we easily identify that the child's using marijuana. Okay. And then we treat the marijuana, but we haven't dug underneath the surface to figure out that this kid is using marijuana because he's struggling with, with anxiety or he's, or he's got some type of depression and that doesn't get treated. Well, well yeah, if that's not treated, they'll just find another coping mechanism. They'll find another coping mechanism or they'll relapse and get back into, say, yeah. using marijuana again. It's, it, yeah. uh, unfortunately, it, it might be something that just repeats itself. 
So the last one to talk about in this process disorders, I suppose, since we've talked about the, um, the self-harm and the eating disorder kind of in that same category a little bit, but what about um, the gaming? We said that's a different. Yeah, I, I did not really see that many adolescents that were dealing with what we would call a gaming addiction. Okay. Um, the ones I did see were boys, not girls. They tended to be very young, um, but I don't really think that um, that it's a high percentage of kids. Now, okay. if you notice that your kid is spending a lot of time gaming and staying up until two, three o'clock in the morning and not getting their schoolwork done, then yeah, it's a big issue for you. And you need to address it by putting limitations on their ability to spend so much time gaming. And is there also an underlying psychological or mental health um there there could be there could be and mm -hmm. and you know i would also get an assessment done a professional assessment done um and that may either rule in or rule out whether or not maybe there's an underlying issue that your child is using the gaming to cope with okay well we're, we're going to talk about in a bit we're going to talk about where to go for those sort of sources yeah um but before that i wanted to talk about again jumping back into that developing brain um, i know these are different parts of the brain that are affected mm -hmm. by these various drugs um, and and addictions but i was wondering if you could tell us sort of about them and and just really explain to the parents what's happening to their kid when these things why they're going back like what, what the addiction does um actually chemically and physically Apart yeah, well, from the emotional and mental, you know. Yeah, well, with addiction, we know that um, our brain has certain chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. um, and those chemicals do different things. And yeah. the one that's really important in addiction is dopamine. Dopamine is a pleasure chemical. So when we go to dinner or we go to a movie um, um, and we feel some joy and some pleasure it's because the dopamine in our brain has increased so an increasing dopamine causes pleasure the same is true when you take a drug Dr these drugs affect dopamine in the brain yeah. so that when uh, a, pr a child an adult uh, is using a drug there's a spike in dopamine in the brain that's the pleasure that comes from using a drug now in time what happens is our brain adjusts to that and we develop what's called tolerance so that um, more and more of the substance is needed to get the pleasure that we're seeking um, you know you might you might get a high say by taking one pill and it gets you high because of the dopamine increase. Yeah. And then after a while, you notice one pill doesn't give you that high anymore. So what do you do? You go to two pills, you get more dopamine, and eventually three pills and then four pills. Um, but the pleasure that's coming from a drug, whether it's a child, teenager, or an adult, is because of that rise in dopamine in the brain, which is the pleasure chemical that the teenager is trying to get or the adult is trying to get. So eating food in and of itself is not a bad thing, right? It no, we have to have food. Bodies. We have to eat to live. Exactly. Uh, and so we... having having a dopamine release in your brain is is normal. It is normal. So, but obviously excessive and, and the buildup tolerance is not normal. But what is the damage that is done to other parts of your, of your brain and your body by these chemicals? Yeah. Well, you sort of hit on one of the keys is that, you know, an increase in dopamine is pleasure. And we like mm -hmm. pleasure. Um, the problem is that drugs cause huge surges of dopamine, far more than the brain was built to handle. So it's abnormal. So, so it's very abnormal. That, you know, we go to a movie, we go on a date, whatever it is, our, yeah. our dopamine increases, we feel pleasure. That's not the same as drugs. Drugs give a person a huge amount of dopamine. It's almost like a rush of dopamine. Okay. Um, and uh, and that's 
That's the primary issue with these drugs. They all affect the dopamine in the brain to cause a surge of dopamine. Now, when I was working with teenagers that were smoking marijuana, we would do some psychological testing on these young men and women. And they were all very bright. Many of them had superior IQs, very high IQs. These are very bright young men and women. But when the psychological test came back, and these are kids that were smoking a lot of marijuana, what I noticed from the testing was that the processing speed of the brain was below average. The brain just wasn't clicking along the way it should. Sorry, below, below their own average or below average in general? Below the average of what it should have been for their age. Wow. And so the processing speed was slower than what it should have been. Mm-hmm. The short-term memory was impaired. They just okay. weren't able to hold on to things as well. And of course, their motivation wasn't very good either. So yeah. as a parent, you might not notice these subtle changes going on in the brain. You're not going to notice that there's a difference in your child's processing speed of their brain. That's uncovered through testing. Uh, it's not necessarily observable unless it's really bad. And the short-term memory, you may catch on to that. But again, this points to the need of if you suspect your child is using a substance, you should get a psychological assessment done. Uh, to uncover if any of these other issues are going on that need to be dealt with and treated. So that marijuana that has the THC in it, it's addictive. Yes. Um, is the THC, I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is beyond creating an addiction, what does it actually damage in the body? Um, potentially the lungs and the brain. Okay. Uh, because you're introducing a foreign subject, uh, substance okay. into both of those. And, and the other thing is that the THC that's around these days is not like the THC that was around in the 60s. Okay. Um, because the THC content back in the 60s was around 2 to 3%. 2 okay. to 3%. Today, it gets, it gets 40, 50, 60%. So Whoa. the marijuana that's out there today is much more powerful than the marijuana, say that your parents or your grandparents might have been smoking in the 60s. Oh, wow. That's a huge increase. That's and, what, and, 20 and, times? A, and a lot of it is um, it, where it's legal. A lot of it is grown um, hydroponically. A lot of it is grown with a lot of scientific effort. So okay. it's being cultivated to have these higher levels of THC in it. Okay. But, um, you know, some parents, for example, and grandparents that might have grown up in the 60s, and were smoking marijuana, they were smoking marijuana with a 2% THC or a 3% okay. THC, they need to recognize that that's not the marijuana these kids today are smoking. So called the same thing, but not the same thing chemically. It's much more potent. Yeah kidding much that's more a lot that's oh, a dramatic increase that's huge is that like what two thousand percent or something? i can't that's insane yeah insane so okay wow sorry i'm just trying to wrap my head around that <laughs> <laughs> the bottom <laughs> line is that marijuana is a lot more powerful these days than what it's been in the past yeah and and yet kids are taking it to relax, just to feel at a baseline normal. To, yeah. to get up in a lot of cases, they, they like that feeling of being high, that rush of dopamine in the brain. Okay. And in some cases, they're using it to get out of a, 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 a thought, a feeling, or a memory that is uncomfortable to them. And if they use the marijuana, they sort of get some temporary relief from those disturbing thoughts or memories or feelings. So marijuana does that to the brain. Um, yes. What about some of the other drugs we were talking about or, or um, practices yeah, what, we were talking about? Is what they all, the pathways? Yeah, what they all have in common is that surge of dopamine. Okay. And that stop and go system you were talking about, can you um, explain that a little bit? Well, um, I'm not sure how I explained that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, but, a system that inhibits you and says this is going to be bad later you don't want to do this but then that 
pleasure system, that dopamine says, go for it, do it. It felt good. Yeah, it, it's almost like the brain is competing against itself. You know, there's a there's a stop system which says, okay, you really don't want to do this. And then you have the go system, which is fueled by dopamine. And that sort of overrides the stop system. And that sort of works in with a, with a, with a child being able to, to use the substance. Oh, goodness. And so it just... It just takes over. It, yeah, it does as the uh, as the to tolerance for the substance builds and the child or the adult is not getting the pleasure that they used to get. So they up the dosage yeah. um, and then that has to continue um, uh, and, and, and oftentimes um, leads to them getting severely addicted. Oh, goodness. Um, this may be a little bit off topic, but did you ever deal with or see caffeine addiction? Um, I did not uh, see okay. very much caffeine addiction, but again, I'm dealing with the adolescent population. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you may see that a lot more in the adult population, but even among our adult patients, I did not see a lot of, of caffeine. They, they were in for much more serious drug use than, yeah, than caffeine. Yeah, that's fair enough. I just know that some people do get that, you know, caffeine addiction. So I wasn't sure to what extent you can become addicted to anything, you know, because <laughs> what is it? It's just basically compulsive use. Yeah. Uh, you can see it with gambling. You can see it with uh, sex. You can see it with uh, uh, gaming. Um, you can see it. Any, 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 beha any behavior can become addictive. And is it the official term was substance abuse disorder, sub substance yeah. use disorder? Substance use disorder. We've we've disorder. we've renamed it from uh, abuse and dependency to now being called a substance use disorder, which can be uh, either mild, moderate, or severe. Severe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, I was hoping you could also tell us about moving on to those um, symptoms. What to watch for? What parents should watch for? You know that that's such an important reason as to why I wrote my book. Yeah. Um, I would sit yeah, across every chapter. It was like, I had this whole bullet point, watch yeah. for this, watch <laughs> for this. These are the symptoms. And at that yeah. point, get them assessed. Yeah. I would sit across from parents and I would go through their child's history of using substances. How old, how young they were, how old were they when they started? What drugs or alcohol were they using? How often were they using? And give them a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. And when I looked at them and they, looked at me and I'd finished, they would look across and they would say, I had no idea this was going on. Oh. Or if they did suspect their child was using a substance, they might say, I sort of thought something was going on, but I didn't think it was this bad. And these are good parents. These were very good parents doing the best job they can. Oh. They missed the warning signs because nobody told them what to look for. Okay. And that was the motivation for me writing this book, to help parents know what to look for, know what to do, yeah. feel less paranoid and more confident that if they have to deal with this issue, they hope they don't, but if they do have to deal with this issue, they feel more confident that they're prepared to deal with it and they know what to do. Um, so my message to parents is aside from buy the book uh, yeah. my message to parents is look for the warning signs and as a general rule i have the specific warning signs in my in my book but as a warn as, as a general rule what i say to parents is pay attention to the changes you see in your child you know your child better than anyone Pay attention to the changes that you see in your child. Don't assume that they're just normal adolescent acting out behaviors. They may very well be that, but they also might be an indication that there's something else going on underneath the surface. So some examples, a child whose grades are starting to decline, a child who used to participate in sports or extracurricular activities no longer shows any interest in doing that. A child who used to introduce you to their friends, you knew who their friends were, now becomes very secretive of who their friends are. And then obviously, if you uh, notice any strange odors or any paraphernalia around the house, those are, those are obvious signs. Um, so if, if you are concerned as a parent, 
what, what should you do? What's the first thing you should do? The first thing you should do is have a discussion with your child. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, you don't want to accuse the child. You don't want to threaten the child. You don't want to punish the child. You want to come at this discussion with an inquiring point of view and keep the focus on you. I'm noticing these things and they concern me. Can you help me understand why I feel this way? I suspect you've been smoking marijuana because of this and that. Can you help me understand why I'm concerned about what's been going on? So you keep the focus on you, not on yeah. the child. And you invite the child into a discussion about what your concerns are. Now, that's a discussion that's likely to go one of two ways. It's either going to blow up and the child's going to become argumentative and angry, or you might learn a few things. But regardless of how that initial discussion or, or goes, if you're still concerned, you need to move to get the assessments done that I recommend in my book. And as well, I remember you mentioned that, um, like that one girl that made the edible marijuana brownies and then the dog ate them. Yeah. <laughs> she told um, her parents, when they saw the dog sleeping in the middle of the day, she said, oh, I took him, to, took him on a long walk and tired him out. Um, <laughs> and also teenagers are just really good at hiding stuff. Yeah, they're so, clever. <laughs> would you also have maybe a third outcome of, of that conversation where they maybe deceive or gaslight, you know, be like, oh, what are you talking about? That's just, you know. Yeah, that's sort of what I meant when I said it's likely to blow up. I mean, okay. you know, they they may get angry, they may not get angry, or they may get defensive, they just might outright deny everything and say, no, I'm, I haven't been doing anything. And that's why I said, as a parent, if you're concerned, have that initial discussion, see how it goes, and then okay. get the assessments done that I recommend in my book. Get the professional uh, assessments and advice so that as a parent, you either rule in or rule out what's going on and then get some advice on what to do next. So what would you say to a parent who's concerned about damaging their relationship with a child with false accusation? Your first responsibility is to keep your child safe. That overrides everything else. Yes, okay. the child's, you know, I, when I was working at Menninger Clinic, I never met a teenager who voluntarily wanted to come into the hospital. Most of them came in yelling and screaming and angry and argumentative and they hated their parents. But after a couple of weeks, as they settled into the program, that sort of went down and they got involved in the program and a lot of them did exceptionally well. So as a parent, your obligation is to keep your child safe and to yeah. do what needs to be done to keep that child safe. They're not gonna wanna get an assessment done they're not going to want to go to counseling and they're sure not going to want to go to treatment, but what's your alternative? Allow them to continue to struggle, allow them to continue to, to, to use substances. That's not a reasonable expectation. And, the, and these are hard decisions that parents have to make. They really struggle with them. They're painful. Um, you know, you know, telling your child they have to go to counseling, telling your child they have to get assessments done telling your child you're going to put them into a treatment program or a residential treatment program. Those are not easy things to do. No. But as a parent, those are things that sometimes we're called on to keep our kids safe. So once they get into that assessment, once they, once they start that process, what does it look like? Well, um, basically, a lot of it will involve some type of testing. When I did addictions assessment, there was a test that I would give a child and the results helped me narrow down whether they had an addiction or not, or whether they had a substance use disorder and whether it was mild, moderate or severe. So depending on, you know, whether it's an addictions assessment, a psychological assessment, a neuropsychological assessment, the professional has a number of tools that they can use to to assess what's going on with your child and and all of which is geared to coming out to either rule in or rule out if there's a diagnosis and then if okay. there is a diagnosis the next step is a treatment plan what should you as, as a parent do what's next some kids will do very well in an outpatient program some will do very well in what we call an intensive outpatient program where they see somebody maybe two or three times a week. And then for some kids, 
uh, not all, but for some kids, they will do very well in what's called a residential program. These tend to be kids who have very serious substance abuse issues and very serious psychological issues. They will do much better in a longer term residential program. I'm just trying to think of the most common scenario that you encountered. Would that be the marijuana and anxiety? Among, uh, among many of the teenagers in terms mm -hmm. of substances, it was marijuana and alcohol. In terms of in in terms of psychological disorders, um, it was anxiety, some depression, but a lot of emerging personality disorders. Um, okay. Things like maybe uh, early early signs of an emerging schizophrenia, or some other type of personality disorder. Maybe it's a um, you know an, uh, some type of behavioral disorder that was developing. Um, uh, but again, this I worked in a psychiatric hospital, so we were seeing the more severe cases. Um, right. and, a, and a lot of teenagers, it, it might be as simple as they're struggling with anxiety, or maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they're feeling somewhat depressed, uh, in which case that child probably is, is going to need some help either with medication or counseling. So would that be an outpatient or an intensive outpatient? Depending on the severity of, of the diagnosis, it could be either. Um, okay. If, you know, in a lot of cases, kids will do very well in an outpatient program where they might see somebody once or twice a week. Uh, but the more severe the issues and the more complex the issues, and by that I mean substance abuse and mental health, the more severe and the more complex the issues are, the diagnoses are, the more likely that child is going to move up the scale to, um, to either intensive outpatient or residential if it's a really severe issue that they're coping with. Okay. Yeah, that's really good to give sort of an idea of, I'd, I'd like to help the most, the broadest swath of people and kind of get an idea of what the most common, um, I hate to say common because it's not common, but you know, the most uh, wide range. The most, freak, the most frequent would probably be the outpatient program. Okay. Um, that would be the one that I think a large number of kids would, would be able to do very well in, and that's an outpatient program. And what does that look like? That's, that's where a child might be uh, meeting with a counselor, uh, maybe once a week, maybe uh, a couple of times a week. Uh, and then, you know, as they start to show improvement, it gets scaled down. Um, okay. If if the issue is a little bit more severe, they would be in an, in an intensive outpatient program where the difference is instead of meeting with a counselor maybe once a week, they might meet with them two or three times a week. It's just more intensive. Okay, so you just step up the access. To the step up health. the access based upon the severity of the problem. Okay. Um, speaking of of counselors and of that psychological help, mm -hmm. do you have any um, advice or experience or, or what would you say to parents who find out that their child has this addiction and they're just racked with guilt because I know women often yeah we just carry around guilt for things we said I'm their mother I should have prevented this I should have why didn't I how didn't I see this xyz what I think what would you advise for the moms like that my advice is that's very common you know that you're human and and you are going to have those emotions you know you 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 you're going to second guess yourself you're going to wonder how did this happen how did this happen to my child what did i do wrong what did i miss um and and, and the reality of the situation is um if you're going through this, my advice is build a support system for yourself because you're going to need it, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's a community organization, if it's a church, whatever it is, build yourself 
a support network. It doesn't have to be a lot of people. It could be two or three trusted friends, but just somebody that you feel safe talking to about what you're going through, because this is going to be a journey. This is going to take some time and you're going to need some help. The other thing that I would like for parents to understand is that sometimes we have the idea that this can't happen to our child. This happens to other kids. This doesn't happen to my kid. And I can tell you that every child is vulnerable to being captured by alcohol or drugs. Oh, that's no, so scary. That's no scary. child, no child is totally protected. There's protective environments, but no child is totally protected. It doesn't matter where you live, urban, suburban, rural area. It doesn't matter what your level of income is. It doesn't matter what church you go to, or, and it doesn't matter what school you send your child to. Every child is vulnerable. I've treated kids who went to some of the most exclusive schools in the country. I've treated kids who came from families that were making millions of dollars. So just be aware, don't become paranoid about this. You know, don't become paranoid about it. What you wanna do is you want to um, feel prepared. You wanna know what the warning signs are. It's like anything else. If you know what the warning signs are, whether it's addiction or a medical issue, you're much more likely to catch it early on and you're much more likely to get treatment and resolve it. So parents, don't become paranoid about this. Become knowledgeable about it. Knowledge is power. The more you know, the less afraid and paranoid you'll be. And hopefully the more confident that if you have to deal with this issue, you hope you don't, but if you do, you feel prepared to deal with it. Yeah. I, I, that brought to mind a thought of, um, you know how, well, as women, we're taught, taught like how to check for breast cancer. We're taught, like you said, to be aware, how to see yeah. signs of things right. like this. Um, is there a way to create, or how would you suggest creating a culture in the home where this is something we talked about, talk about openly? We say, you know, these are, we say these are drugs that not, not that we're trying to advertise them, but say, you know, these drugs exist. This is what they do to you. And, and create a culture where it's like, it's not some secretive, shameful thing. Yeah. It's shining a light on it, I suppose. I don't know. No, I think that's an excellent thought because you want to have open discussions about these issues. Um, some parents don't want to have the discussion about sex. You know, uh, some parents don't want to have the discussion about drugs. It's almost as if, well, I talk about it, it's probably going to happen. No, if you don't talk about it, it's probably going to happen or it may happen. But you want to develop these conversations with your child in an open and honest way. You want to hopefully have discussions where you're getting their input. You're getting their feedback. Don't just tell them marijuana is bad. They don't believe that. Tell them what you think about marijuana. Tell them you're concerned about marijuana. And they ask, well, why are you concerned? Tell them about the brain. You know, tell them you're concerned about the developing brain and, and teach them about the brain and try to open up those conversations. Um, yeah, well, they're, they're, sorry, they're, just, not, they're not before lectures. Before we carry on with that, sorry, just speaking of which, could you just tell um, again what you told me before we started recording about the difference that made to the, to the people you were working with? You explain yes. the... Yeah. When, when I was working with teenagers, um, it didn't do me any good to tell them drugs are illegal. They didn't care. Uh, it didn't tell them do, it didn't do me any good to, to tell them that drugs were bad for them because they didn't believe it. And it didn't do me any good to tell them, well, if you keep using these drugs, you might not graduate from high school. You might not go to college and you might not get a job because they didn't believe any of that. So what did capture their attention? What captured their attention was when I talked to them about the neuroscience, when I talked to them about the brain, they were curious about the brain. They wanted to know how the brain worked. So I started by introducing them to the brain. We have different areas of the brain, for example, that do different things. Some of them, some areas of the brain help us to talk. Some of them help us to walk. Some areas of the brain help us to reason. This is what the brain is. This is what it does. These are the different areas. And then when they understood that, I turned to talk to them about what drugs do in the brain. So first, 
they learned about the brain, then they learned about how these drugs in the brain work. And in my book, there's a there's a chart picture of a brain shows the different areas of the brain and what they do and then there's a chart that shows where marijuana attaches itself in the brain you show that to these kids and they immediately see this is what marijuana is doing to my brain that's an entirely different insight than me telling them it's illegal or it's bad for them they see for themselves how marijuana works in the brain so they're learning the actual principle behind the practice that you're teaching to not to not use that. They're learning the neuroscience. They're yeah. learning the importance of the brain, how it works, how it develops, and how drugs can damage it. That they're interested in. And that made the difference. It made the difference. And and the other thing is, it didn't do me any good to tell them to quit. They, they weren't <laughs> going to quit. They didn't want to quit. They would tell me, I'm not quitting. So when they told me they weren't going to quit, my response was, after you learn all of this, are you willing to do an experiment? And they said, oh, okay, what kind of experiment? I said, stay off marijuana for six months, just six months, stay off six months. And at the end of that six months, assess how you feel and how different it is. Because I was betting that after six months, they would see such an increase in how they felt and how they thought and how they acted, they wouldn't go back. So sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't get far with the kid by telling them, don't ever use. Yeah. You might be better off by saying, let's negotiate a time period where you won't use. Three months, six months, whatever it was. And then we'll reassess how you feel after that. They're much more likely to give that a chance. So they're in control of it. As they're, well. in con they're in control of it. It's not some forever type of proposition like yeah. never smoke again. They can't wrap their head around that. They, that, that that doesn't compute with them but have them negotiate a time period you know you you would wish they'd never use that's the goal but yeah. you may have to start out by compromising and saying let's work a time period when we agree you won't use three months six months and then we'll reassess it hopefully they're going to feel so much better after that three or six months um you know, that they won't go back to using. Now, that also assumes that if they're using the marijuana to treat anxiety, that you're getting the anxiety treated. Because if okay. you don't treat the anxiety, they may not even be able to stay off three days, much less three months. Right. Well, that's fair enough. But it sounds like it'd be a really successful two-pronged approach to that. Yes. It, it you know, it, it's, it's a realistic approach. Yeah. Because like I said, telling them drugs are bad, telling them drugs are illegal, that goes right over their head. They don't care. They don't even listen and they'll shut you off. Uh, yeah. you, have to, you have to approach it from something that captures their attention and that's sometimes the neuroscience. So would you advise parents having that discussion with their kids before drugs even become an issue? Absolutely. In fact, I would, depending on the age of your child, if you have a child in elementary school, Teach them about the neuroscience, not the okay. drugs. No, don't teach them about drugs. If they're in like fourth, fifth, sixth grade, whatever it is, they're very young. They're inquisitive. They want to know things. Teach them about the brain. Get that concept into their head about the brain. Teach them what the brain is. Teach them what the brain does. Teach them what the different areas of the brain do. Impress upon them that their brain needs to be protected and is very vulnerable. And then as they move into middle school, once they have the understanding of the brain in elementary school, once they move into middle school and high school, then you can introduce drugs and how they affect the brain. So first, you want the child to have a clear understanding of the importance of protecting the brain and what it does. Once they have that, you can introduce the drugs and say, now that we know about the brain, let's look at what drugs do to the brain and educate them about that. That, that is so smart. I've never even thought of doing that with my kids, of teaching. I, I've taught them about all sorts of different parts of the anatomy. We, I mean, I actually have an anatomy book mm -hmm. where we'll look at like muscles and, and yeah. things like that. But I don't think I've ever thought, let's dive into regions of the brain. I personally find it fascinating. And but they I do too. And and my guess is kids will too, because they're naturally curious. They want to learn. So let's teach them about the brain and then let's introduce how drugs work in the brain. I love that. That's such a good idea. 
Is there, are there any other preventative things that you would suggest for parents to do? Um, well, well, we've talked about, we've talked about not letting them have access to alcohol or um, drugs. in the home. Yeah. Or uh, medication. Right. Prescribed medication at home. Um, we've talked about teaching them the neuroscience. Right. Is there anything else that you would suggest? Uh, what we talked about earlier, and that is work on developing good communications with your child. And, and by that, I mean listening skills. We're, we're pretty good when we talk with each other of hearing what we say. You know, so when we're talking to our child, we're, we're pretty good at hearing their words. We're not so good at, list, at hearing the feelings behind those words. And that's a skill that every parent can practice and every parent can learn. It takes a little bit of time, takes a little bit of work, but you can develop a skill where you are picking up on your child's um, feelings, not just their words, but their feelings. Uh, if you have a very young child, um, elementary school, on my website, I have 10 questions that you can ask your child to check in on their mental health. Some of them are pretty interesting. One, one example is you can ask your child, if your feelings were weather, what kind of a day would it be? Oh. And, you know, so there's some others on, on the website, too. But that's just a real quick way to check in with your child and, and say something as simple as, you know, if, if how you're feeling right now was weather, what kind of a day would it be? They might tell you it's a sunny day. They might tell you it's a rainy day or a cloudy day or whatever. And then you can carry on the discussion from there. I never thought of that either. That's a really good question, though. It just yeah. simplifies it. It does. It distills it. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have another question. What if you have a lot of kids and life is very, very busy and um, you don't always have time to do those one-on-one -on -one connections? Is that perhaps offset a lot or, or at all by the amount of interaction they have and the fact that they have other siblings? Do you, do you see more use or less use or does it not matter with the amount of siblings in a family? I think it complicates the issue. I think it makes more of a challenge for parents. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot depends on the age difference between those siblings. Okay. Um, obviously, if they're close together, that's one issue. If they're five, six, seven years apart, that makes a different uh, dynamic. So, yeah. but, but, and, and, you know, each child is different. Uh, you may have a child that's struggling with anxiety. You might have another one who has ADHD. Um, so, you know, it definitely complicates the, 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 the issue and the struggle for parents to, to deal with all of that. But the principles are still the same. Okay, that's fair enough. It's a good, it's a good idea. I think to, uh, I think it's a matter you'd have to prioritize to consciously say, hey, I'm going to check in with my kids and ask yeah. them the weather question or some and of life, the other questions. And life gets very busy uh, yeah. and, you know, it gets very hectic, um, and, but it just takes some practice to be able to make it a priority and to do it every once Check, Like you say, check in with your child every once in a while well, and pay attention I, to the changes that you see in any of your yeah. children. Yeah. To be aware of that. Yes. Be watchful, I suppose. Right. Yes. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot more, um, like all the questions that are all the, the 10 questions on your website and everything. So what I think we'll do is we'll just link that in the show notes and people can go in and pull them off of there. Okay, great. Have them online so they can, because I don't think they'd remember, remember them all if we just listed them. No, if right they here. go to the website, give them a link. If they go to the website, um, they'll see a number of blog articles and okay. one of those blog articles uh, is these questions. Oh, that's so good. Okay, well, I am really appreciative of your time. Thank you so well, much. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some of these things that you've been mentioning. I okay. haven't thought of them before. It's really quite good. Well, if you, uh, if you get any questions from your audience, I don't know if you hear from them from time to time, or family or friends, and they come up with questions that maybe we haven't talked about or they would like for us to talk about, just reach out, let me know. I'll be glad to come back and, uh, and talk again and address any issues that um, perhaps your friends or family might bring up that we didn't get to today. Yeah, I, th I think I might have my own, actually, <laughs> after this as well. <laughs> okay.
All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, everybody, everything will be linked below. And we really hope you learn from this and that you can use it going forward with your families and your own kids and that you're able to, I, I feel like so much of the time, a lot of time is spent as Richard's done taking care of the back end of things. And that's important. But I also want us to focus on stopping us even getting there. Yeah. The hard times. So thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for uh, having a discussion with me. I appreciate it and helping me reach out to others. Thank you.